The topic for our study in this session today is Armageddon. We're not going to look at Armageddon entirely on its own because Armageddon is recorded in the book of Revelation in chapter 16, but it is one of seven plagues mentioned in this chapter. So we need to put it into context, first of all. These plagues, we are told, are poured out upon those of the wicked those that have the mark of the beast, it mentions them specifically with the first plague, and fell a noisome, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second plague is poured out upon the sea and it became like the blood of a dead man. Every living creature in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, that's the fresh water, drinking water, and they also became turned to blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast, and shall be, because they have judged thus, thou hast judged thus, for they have shed the blood of saints, and you have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And another, another voice out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun and power was given the sun to scorch men with great heat and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God which had power over these plagues they repented not to give him glory the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and the kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth hour poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to the great battle of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief in the night. Blessed is he that watcheth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were light voices and thunderings and lightnings, there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the fierceness of the wine of the wrath of God. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, about 50, 56 pounds weight each. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Here's a list of seven plagues, Revelation chapter 16. The seven last plagues they are called. Ellen White tells us that they are the most terrible judgments that have ever fallen on the earth, even worse than the plagues that fell in ancient Egypt. Strange as it may seem that some people want to allegorize these plagues away and even have some of the plagues falling on God's people. Whereas the Bible tells us God's people will be protected. Psalm 91 says, No plague will come nigh your dwelling. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Seventh-day Adventists have studied the question of these plagues and particularly of Armageddon for many years. The so-called traditional Adventist view of Armageddon is that it will be a war between Eastern nations and Western nations fought at a place called Armageddon in Palestine. In more recent years, an alternative or so-called new view of Armageddon has been put forth. It may be new to some, 
but it was taught by some of our early pioneers. This understanding is what we will set forth in this study today. There are many aspects of unfulfilled prophecy about which we ought not to be dogmatic. We therefore need to be tolerant of those who hold a different view. Ellen G. White gave us counsel in her writings, counsel to writings, writers and editors, page 37. She wrote, we have many lessons to learn and many, many lessons to unlearn. Those who think that they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have an occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. And I've lived long enough to see that fulfilled. Ellen G. White gave his counsel in her writings. <clears throat> we, if we do not think that we're going to have to change some opinions, we will be disappointed because we will have to. Now Ellen G. White and her use of the word Armageddon. The word Armageddon does not appear in the book Great Controversy. Some people think that is strange because she mentions all the other plagues by name but she doesn't mention Armageddon by name. But it does appear in several of her articles published in church papers back in her lifetime. For example, we read some of these reprinted, reprinted in the Seventh Adventist Bible Commentary, page 983, which wrote, We need to study the pouring out of the seventh vial. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle. But providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lighted with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, the religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. That's an interesting statement. The armies of the living God will take the field in this battle. Note that Ellen White wrote, beginning with the seventh plague, then she went back to the sixth plague, then to the loud cry mentioned in Revelation 18. This is when the forces of good and evil will awake from slumber. That means that uh, apparently they're not wide awake at the present time, but sort of slumbering, like some people in the church, likewise slumbering. This indicates that the church is largely asleep today and needs to wake up. As long as we sleep, Satan too rests, for he knows that the end will not come until the church finishes its work. When the church awakes, you can be sure the devil will get busy. Let us look now at the question of Armageddon as a spiritual conflict. Today, most Seventh-day Adventist ministers and theologians that I know believe that Armageddon will be a spiritual conflict rather than a literal conflict gathering of eastern nations for war against western nations in Palestine. That it will be a struggle between good and evil, the last great battle of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, in which the church is attacked by Satan and his evil confederation just before the second advent. You see, there are some difficulties with the view of Armageddon as being a literal war. Some have thought that the Asian nations would one day join together and fight the Western nations, namely the USA and Europe. It was thought that this war would be fought in Palestine on the plains of Megiddo, a large valley northeast of Mount Carmel and north of the ancient fortress of Megiddo. In this view, the river Euphrates would literally be dried up, thus making it easier for the armies of the Asian nations to reach the battlefield. In all aspects of this prophecy, if all aspects of this prophecy are to be taken literal, literally, the Euphrates would be no barrier to a modern army. I've crossed the river Euphrates probably more than once when I was in Iraq. During World War II, armies crossed many rivers larger than the river Euphrates. In fact, armies crossed oceans during World War II some have suggested that the Euphrates might be symbolic of the Arab or the Muslim nations that are found in the Middle East. If the Euphrates is taken as symbolic, then one would have to allow that other things in the prophecy might also be symbolic. Even the battle itself could be symbolic. Now let us study phrase by phrase and see what the prophecy says so that we can better understand if 
we explore this question of symbolism further. Revelation 16.12 talks about the kings of the east. Who are they? In the Old Testament, they were believed to be Oriental kings or Asian kings. It was uh, claimed that this was, of course, obvious. Throughout history, some Asian nations have put the emblem of the sun on their flags, the sun rising in the east seemed to be a good symbol for the kings of the East. In the Greek, the word East, however, is the word antole. And it does not always mean East on the compass. From Young's Concordance, we find that there are several times when it means something else than East of the compass. Note that an old name for the region of Turkey was Anatolia. Anatolia being based on the Greek word Anatole. For example, Revelation 7, 1 to 2, an angel is described as ascending from the east. Angels come from heaven, not from the east, not from Asia. Anything from outer space approaching the earth would first appear in the eastern sky. So it's logical that the prophet saw the angel approaching from the east since the earth rotates on its axis from the west to the east. Hence, John saw this angel ascending from the east, just as we see the sun rise every day from the east. In Luke 1, verse 78, we read, The day spring from on high hath visited us. This prophecy of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was made about the work of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. The day spring comes from the Greek word anatole, translated in other places as east. And it is a name or title of Jesus in this prophecy. Thus we could read Revelation 16, 12, that the way of the kings of Christ would be prepared. See, the scriptures have applied anatole to Christ in Luke 1 and verse 78. The next question that we can ask is this. Who could the kings of Christ be? Well, Revelation 19, verse 16 says, Christ is called King of kings and Lord of lords. Is he only the king of earthly kings, or does it mean more than this? Revelation 17, 14, Jesus is called Lord of lords and King of kings again. And Revelation 1, 5 to 6 says, And hath made us, the righteous, kings and priests. According to the Bible, therefore, the saints of Jesus are called kings of Christ. In Revelation 24 and 6, I saw thrones and they sat upon them, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So we are called kings and priests, and we'll be reigning with Christ a thousand years during the millennium. Thus in the Bible we see that the righteous can be called kings in the Bible. So Revelation 16.12 could be paraphrased to mean the way of the saints of Christ will be prepared. Any bilingual person knows that there are problems in translation. Often there is no exact word in one language for a word in another language. Also, sometimes there are various shades of meaning for a word in one language, and more than one word in another language is needed to express the various shades of meaning, as no one word in another language can cover them all. For example, I use the word frog, which you may have heard me mention before. It means a little creature that swims in the puddles of water. It can mean a sore throat, railway points where the tracks cross, a carpenter's pouch, the hollow in a brick, the hollow part of a horse's hoof, or part of a bow in bow playing the violin. So in the Bible, words sometimes have more than one meaning, and we have seen that already in the word anatole. Now let us look at the proper nouns as symbols in Revelation. Revelation 9.11, the angel says of the bottomless pit, abaddon in Hebrew, apollyon in the Greek. Revelation 11.8 uses the names Sodom and Egypt as symbol of moral corruption, saying Jesus was crucified in Sodom and Egypt. Well, we know Jesus was crucified in Palestine, just outside the walls of Jerusalem, not in 
Egypt or Sodom. Revelation 17.5 says, Babylon stands not for the literal city that Daniel knew, but for religious apostasy in the last days. Thus the name Euphrates could also stand for something other than the actual river. First of all, let us look at the drying up of the river Euphrates. Was the Euphrates River ever dried up in history? And if so, what could we learn from it that would be relevant to the last days? Well, we read in history that Cyrus came to attack Babylon, but the city was all closed up, that the river Euphrates ran through the center of the city. And so there was a big gate across the river where it entered the city and had high walls down each bank of the river inside the city and there were gates from east to west and uh, you crossed the river in little punt boats, rowing boats or canoes, whatever, to get from one side to another. And the prophecy said that when Cyrus came, he would dry up the waters of the Euphrates and it was fulfilled because the city was closed up and it looked like no one could capture it. But Cyrus put his soldiers to work upstream from the city and diverted the flow of the waters of the river Euphrates into a large swamp that was nearby and that lowered the water in the river at the point where it went through the city and his soldiers were able to wade knee deep or whatever through that uh, riverbed and get into the river inside the city but they still had the walls on either side. But the Bible prophecy said the gates that crossed the passageways between the east and the west of the river would not be shut and they were open. Babylon felt so secure that they didn't close those gates. And Cyrus came in and we are told that Darius <coughs> died that night in the city of Babylon and Babylon fell to the Persians. In the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, we read about this interesting prophecy, foretold how Babylon would one day fall. It fell when the city's waters were dried up, allowing the enemy to come in. The city of Babylon was built on both sides of the river, as I've said, and large gates had been built where the river entered and where it left the city, wall lining the banks of the river inside the city. And there were gates in these walls to allow people to cross the river from one side to the other. When the armies of Cyrus, as I just mentioned, surrounded the city of Babylon, they could not enter it because it had great high walls. However, Cyrus diverted the water of the river upstream by blocking the riverbed and the water flowed into a swamp and he was able to get his soldiers into the city. Jeremiah 51 verse 36 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead my cause and I will dry up her seas and make her springs dry. And it was fulfilled, as we have noted. Isaiah 43, 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two levered gates, and the gates shall not be shut. That's why they were able to get in from the riverbed into the city. Daniel 5 tells us of the fulfillment of these prophecies. Many Bible scholars have seen in this history types of what God is going to do for his people in the last days. There are several parallels between them that we can now see. Isaiah 44 verse 28 says Cyrus was named before his birth and is called God's shepherd. He was seen in that way as a type of Jesus who is called God's shepherd. Why? Well, Jesus is called the good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, John 10, 14, Hebrews 13, verse 20. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, 1 Peter 5, 4, and Cyrus is called God's anointed in Isaiah 45, 1. Acts 10, 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Isaiah 43, 13 says that Cyrus would let God's people go back to Palestine. When Jesus comes, he will take his people to their heavenly home. You see the parallels? what Cyrus did and what God will do in the last days. Revelation 18.4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. God calls his people 
out of Babylon. Here we see another parallel between ancient and modern Babylon. From these parallels, we can see that just as God delivered his people in ancient times from Babylon, a city known for its false religion, he will also deliver his people in the last days as spiritual Babylon seeks to oppress them. Revelation 17, 1 to 5 indicates Babylon is a type of religious apostasy in the last days. Note that the great whore is said to sit on many waters, just as the ancient city did. Hence the drying up of the river Euphrates in the last days can represent for us what God will do in order to deliver his saints. As Cyrus was the deliverer of God's people in ancient times, so Christ will deliver God's people in the last days, in the last great conflict. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up. And at that, at that time my people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Note that Ellen White devoted a whole chapter in the great controversy entitled God's People Delivered. She didn't mention the Euphrates by name. She didn't mention Armageddon by name. But she had a whole chip chapter that covers the history that all these symbols represent for us. So what is Jesus going to do to deliver the saints in the last days when persecution is meted out? The powers and people who support the apostate organization in the last days will withdraw their support before the end, as Revelation 17, 16 says. I quote, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Those that support apostate religion in the last days will eventually see that they have been deceived, and will turn and take vengeance on the power that has deceived them. I mentioned the chapter God's people delivered deals with some of these things. So what is Jesus going to do to the saints, the people who will support the apostate organization? He will burn them with fire. This is a very graphic picture of how the powers that support the papacy in the last days will later turn on her when they see that they have been deceived. This will happen when God delivers his people. Now we need to look at some word studies. I remember an evangelist years ago saying, the Battle of Armageddon is a literal battle because it says about a place, Revelation 16, 13 to 16, gathers the nations together into a place called Armageddon. So he said, it's a place that has to be a literal battle. Well, sometimes some people advertised their ignorance, you know. But the word place that is used there in that passage of Scripture doesn't always mean a location, as we would think. The Greek word for place is the word topos, T-O-P-O-S. In Ministry Magazine, November 1971, pages 18 to 20, there is an interesting article on this word. Several different shades of meaning are conveyed by the Greek word topos. See Moffat's translation, which gives chance, while other translations by, such as Weymouth and Phillips say opportunity. For example, in Acts 25, verse 16, Paul was given license, topos in the Greek, to answer for himself when he was being persecuted on the stairways of the fortress near the temp temple in Jerusalem. He asked for license to speak to the people and defend himself. The word is topos, not a local place, but an opportunity. In Revelation 16, 16, it could be rendered that the nations are set or fixed in a certain condition. They have by that time totally gone over to the side of evil and they cannot change. This will be the condition of the wicked after the close of probation. As we saw, no one changes sides. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 to 17, I read about Esau. You remember that he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of lentil soup when he was hungry, despising his birthright. Later on, he wanted to get it back, but it was too late because he had uh, separated himself from it and given it to another. 
It is obvious no geographical place is meant when it says Esau found no place for repentance. It doesn't mean that if he found a certain square meter somewhere, he could repent there, but he could not repent there. It means that he was in that condition of heart and soul that he could no longer repent. We might say he had despised his birthright, birthright to such an extent that he no longer had spiritual inclinations having committed, we might say, the unpardonable sin. Now let's look at the word Armageddon. The King James Version of the English Bible has the word Armageddon. But this is not an accurate translation of the Greek word in the Greek New Testament. The Greek word in the New Testament is Harmageddon, H-A-R. There's an H in front of Armageddon. H-A-R is a prefix in the uh, Greek language, or Hebrew language, the Greek language here, meaning a mountain. There's a real problem with those who argue for a literal battle because there is no mountain called Mageddon in Palestine. We have Megiddo, but no mountain called Megiddo. <coughs> there was an ancient fortress town of Megiddo, and its ruins are well known today. I've been there more than once. It looks over the valley of Jezreel, or the plain of Jezreel to the north and northeast, called Esdralion. However, no location or mountain exists or exists in the area called Mageddon. It seems that Haramageddon is a coined word as it appears nowhere else in the Hebrew literature. As mentioned above, Megiddo is known. Several battles were fought there. Judges 4 and 5 says Sister and fought Deborah and Barak there. Josiah fought Pharaoh Necho of Egypt there, 2 Kings 23. Those who hold to a literal battle have thought that the Asian nations would fight the Western nations in the valley or plain of Jezreel, or as Dralion, as it sometimes is called. However, this valley or plain is not very large, only about 20 miles by 5 miles. It could not hold all the armies of the nations involved, and one or two hydrogen bombs dropped there would destroy everybody there anyway. Modern warfare is not like it was back in the days of the apostles. Thus many commentators say that Armageddon will be a literal battle fought at Mount Megiddo, but there is no such mountain. Some call the Valley of Jezreel the Valley of Megiddo, but the Bible says Mount Magedon, not a valley. And Dr. Lowesby said we ought to get away from the idea of Megiddo altogether. He was a lecturer in the Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. It has been said that the meaning of Megiddo is the Greek place of God, but the word is not Megiddo, but Magedon. Two meanings in the Greek have been suggested by Dr. Ronald Lowesby. Mount of slaughter, from the Hebrew word Gadar, which means to cut, or glorious mount, from the Hebrew word Magad, to be glorious. Well, how does this work out? Hence there are two suggestions. Haram again could be a coined word expressed, expressing two truths. The first, that God's people will experience a glorious mountaintop experience when they are delivered while the wicked will be cut or destroyed when they are slaughtered by God at the end of time. Dr. Lodby argued that God will work through Mount Zion and the church to deliver his saints and speaks of the Mount of Assembly where the wicked will be judged and punished. It appears that there is a play on words here, even made up words, in order to convey to us spiritual truths of what God will do at the end time for his people. That is, by making up a new word, John has revealed vast theological truth. The truth that God's people, who will be involved in the last great battle in the great controversy just before Jesus comes, will be in that topos or condition or mountaintop experience that will result in their glorious deliverance, while the wicked will be in that topos or condition that will result in their slaughter, their destruction. See Jeremiah 25, 33 and Revelation 14, 18 to 20. Ellen G. White wrote 
about this in her book, The Great Controversy. Pages 634 to 635. Glorious will be the deliverance of those who have patiently waited for his coming. When the wicked try to destroy God's faithful followers, the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of his people, and the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. God will deliver his people. It will be a glorious deliverance. Page 636, 637. It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. Here is given a picture of God's judgment on the wicked. And page 654, 656. These pages describe the feelings and actions of the wicked when they realize that God has conquered and that they have lost. They will turn on those who have deceived them and great will be their suffering. Dr. W.G.C. Murdoch, former dean of the SDA Theological Seminary, said in the class presentation, when I was present, when Jesus comes, he will not find the world sitting down in a peace conference. There will be war and bloodshed everywhere. During all this turmoil, God's people will be protected. Psalm 91.7 says, A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Great Controversy 636, 637 says in these pages that when God's voice is heard delivering his people, which will encourage them, the people utter a shout of victory. God's people utter a shout of victory. Notice how Ellen White writes about the seven last plagues in the Great Controversy. On page 628, she talks about the first four plagues, all mentioned on that page. Then on page 636, she talks about the fifth plague of darkness. Then the seventh plague she mentions on page 637. Note that she seems to have overlooked the sixth plague, which deals with Armageddon. The word Armageddon is not found anywhere in her book, The Great Controversy. Did she mention all the other plagues and ignore the sixth one? It seems very unlikely indeed. Where then can her treatment of the sixth plague be found? Well, the whole chapter God's people delivered in the Great Controversy, page 635 to 652, covers the last great effort of Satan to overthrow God's church. This is the final phase of the Great Controversy between Christ and Satan just before the Second Coming, when he will appear in the clouds of heaven to gather his people together and take them home to their home in heaven. It's a description of a great struggle. It seems in Ellen White's treatment, the seventh plague which covers the battle of Armageddon. Why did she not use the word Armageddon in her book, The Great Controversy? It would appear that she was practicing what she had told others to do. She had advised others not to embark on courses of conduct in their teachings, preaching and writing that would have the potential to split the church. Uriah Smith, back in those days, was teaching and writing that Armageddon was a literal battle between the nations of the East Asia and the nations of the West, Europe and North America. Instead of publicly attacking Uriah Smith's position, she quietly wrote out her understanding on the subject without naming the battle in her book, never using the word Armageddon. However, in other of her writings, which were not in her lifetime given the prominence her book received, she did mention Armageddon by name. That's interesting. And was more specific about her beliefs as to its nature. That is, that Armageddon will be the last great battle between the forces of good and evil, as we can see from the examination of her writings, as we will now present. As editor of the Review and Herald for many years, Uriah Smith published his views of an East-West battle and wrote it up in his book, Thoughts of Daniel and the Revelation. Thus the church came to largely accept his views. However, today, most Seventh-day Adventists hold to the views that Ellen White taught in her other writings. There are several views that Uriah Smith held 
that are not held in mainstream Adventist circles today. For example, his views on the King of the North and the Daily, mentioned in Daniel 8, 11 and 12. We could also add there some of his views on the Trinity, because he was an Arian. In Councils to Writers and Editors, page 7677, Ellen White said that she wrote that her husband, James White, quote, had some ideas on some points differing from the views taken by his brethren. I was shown that however true his views were, God did not call for him to put them in front before his brethren and create differences of ideas. White was very conscious of her, her responsibility, Ellen White, that is, was conscious of her responsibility to preserve the unity of the church and strove to avoid that which would create splits or divisions among the members. Her treatment of Armageddon in her major published work on last day events, the great controversy, shows that she practiced what she preached to others, including her own husband. Now let's look at what she actually wrote about Armageddon in some journal articles. They didn't get the publicity that Uriah Smith's book got until long after he was gone, no doubt. As mentioned above, Ellen White does mention Armageddon elsewhere, but not in her book, The Great Controversy. Of these other writings, some have only been able to made available to us as comp comparatively recently. Some of her statements have recently been republished in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, pages 982 and 983. Let's read some of them and listen carefully to what Ellen White said. Quote, There are only two parties in our world. Those who are loyal to God and those who stand under the banner of the Prince of Darkness. Satan and his angels will come down with power and signs and lying wonders to deceive those that dwell on the earth, and if possible, the very elect. The crisis is right upon us. The battle of Armageddon is soon to be fought. He on whose vesture is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords leads forth the armies of heaven on white horses clothed in fine linen, clean and white. So here the angels of heaven are going to be involved in this battle, according to what Ellen White says. Every form of evil is to spring into intense activity. Evil angels unite their powers with evil men. And as they have been in constant conflict and attained an experience in the best modes of deception and battle and have been strengthening for centuries, they will not yield the last great final conflict without a desperate struggle. All the world will be on one side or the other of the conflict or the question. The battle of Armageddon will be fought and that day must find none of us sleeping. Wide awake we must be as wise virgins having oil in our vessels with our lamps. The power of the Holy Ghost must be upon us and the captain of the Lord's host, that is Jesus himself, will stand at the head of the angels of heaven to direct the battle. Solemn events before us are yet to be transpired. Now that's an interesting statement that Jesus himself is going to be at the head of the angels of heaven to direct them in the Battle of Armageddon. That doesn't sound to me like a war of Asian nations against the Western nations, but a conflict between truth and error in the last days. I read on further. Two great opposing powers, these are Ellen White's words, two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commands. On the other stands the prince of darkness and those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. The angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour out their vials of wrath upon the world. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth under the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict. 
We need to study, she says, the pouring out of the seventh vial or the seventh plague. <coughs> the powers of evil will not yield up the struggle with, with the conflict without a struggle. <coughs> but providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. God has a part in this battle, she says. When the earth is lightened with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, the religious elements of good and evil will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. That doesn't sound like Western armies against Asian armies, but righteous people against the wicked, wicked against the righteous. <coughs> From these statements, it is very clear that Ellen White believed and taught that the Battle of Armageddon would be a spiritual battle between the forces of good and evil. It would involve the angels and God's last great day saints on one side and the forces under Satan's control on the other. The angels of God will be assisting God's people and that Jesus himself is going to direct his armies in the battle. It is very clear from Bible prophecy that Jesus will be the victor in this coming battle. Now, during the Second World War, the nations of the world involved in that great struggle, and I can remember it because I was a boy when the war began, and I used to follow what was happening day by day by listening to the news and reading the newspapers. They, nations, practiced conscription. That is, they called up young men to fight in their armies. They were drafted and put into armies by government orders. World War I, however, the Australian soldiers that fought in World War I were all volunteers. But in World War II it was different. But the Lord's army is only made up of volunteers. God does not force anyone to join his army. He is calling for volunteers for his army to fight in the last great battle between the forces of evil against them. This battle is to be fought just before the coming of Jesus. If the devil can make one of God's sealed saints sin after the close of probation, during the time of Jacob's trouble, then he will win the battle of Armageddon. Because Jesus would have said those words, he that is righteous will now remain righteous. He that is holy will remain holy. If Satan can force one to give up his faith after the close of probation, then he has demonstrated that the words of Jesus are false. But that will not happen. That will not happen. We ought to thank God that the victory in this battle is assured, for Jesus himself will direct the battle. And don't forget, Jesus won the battle over Satan on Calvary 2,000 or more years ago. The Acts of the Apostles, page 600, White wrote, there is nothing that the Saviour desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and his character. There is nothing the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Saviour's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christianity. The Lord is calling each of us. Who will volunteer to be in his army. May God bless you. You make the right choice. Amen. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.